Welcome to the Dungeon Gentleman channel. <laughs> Our exclusive BDSM offshoot of the main channel. How's it going, everybody? Yeah. Goss is master, and I am slave. And today we're going to be Don't read into this! <laughs> Alright, so... Um, yeah, no, we're, we're going to have a good time today. So, there's actually a lot of content on the internet about what we're doing today. We are... Well, we... I have specifically gone and mined a bunch of a hilariously bizarre uh, stories from the subreddit r slash RPG Horror Stories, which is people recounting, like, awful, weird, strange, or mostly embarrassing and cringeworthy things that have happened to them while playing, uh, like, tabletop role-playing games. You'll be relaying them to me because I have, at this point, like, a decade of experience being a dungeon master. More than that, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. And uh, before any of you ask, no, I haven't really played D&D much since 3rd edition. I'm a filthy degenerate who plays Pathfinder, and due to recent events, I'm expecting we'll be getting more players soon. Yeah, no, it's true, it's true. Yeah, th this is going to be a fun a fun one, because Gus, you're primarily a DM, but have you also been a player in campaigns too? Oh, buddy, I've been a player. Yeah, you are a player. I've played a lot of different games, there's a lot of different characters. It's a fun, different side of the coin. The thing about all sorts of tabletop RPGs is that whatever side of the table you're on, there's a social contract there. And when you're playing D&D &D or Pathfinder or Powered by the Apocalypse or any particular game with a group of people, you find out pretty quickly who can hang. It's an excellent vibe test. Yes, it's a vibe check. And I think what's fun about this, you know, Gus is seeing them all blind, I've gathered them, is with Gus having experience as a player character and a DM, we can kind of get into how you would respond as a player for the ones that are bad DMs, and how you'd respond as a DM for the ones that are bad players. And I think also, because um, tabletop role-playing is a valid form of storytelling, Gus and I, as the two professional writers, TM, 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 don't mad about it, we will also be able to evaluate it from a storytelling perspective too, so I think that'll be a whole ton of fun. Exactly! Oh, let's get into this! I love hearing people's, like, freaky little tabletop stories. Yes, okay, so... And definition on freaky with some of these, believe me, there are some uh, sexually <laughs> repressed individuals. Ooh, unsurprising. <laughs> unsurprising. First we have one, and they'll all be up on the screen because I'll send Gus the pictures after this. Uh, one of someone who was described as the worst DM I've ever played with. Are you ready? Let's go. So this is some kind of like want ad. I don't know what on on what site, but it's marked with 18 plus and says campaign with mature content. Always a good sign. <laughs> the body text of this, and it's going to be difficult to read because there is legitimately no punctuation. In this, it's like fucking Cormac McCarthy wrote it after brain surgery. Oh my god. Looking for real gamers. This is not a, I want to hurry up and have sex with every character RP. This is not a, I'm going to join and create my own little side story RP. And this is not a, I'm going to fight and argue with the GM over something because I didn't read. RP. This is an action-adventure RPG, which means combat is heavy in this, so please, no pacifist, no whiny little chump characters. Have you talked about a relationship before you even cast a spell? Then don't even bother. Oh my god, wow. So would you okay. join his game? No, I, I feel like this is like an intensely, like, not just sex negative, but like, like socialization negative experience. <laughs> I don't know why. I just picture the like the like GM that's posting this being fucking uh Senator Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising. I don't want any babies. This is a real game <laughs> yeah. where everyone can follow their own path to justice. Yeah. Fight their own wars. Combat is heavy, so no pacifist, no whiny little chump characters. Have you talk about a relationship before you even cast a spell? Then don't even bother, Jack! No, it's 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 the opposite too, because like this is like this is like an authoritarian just do the fight for everybody. This is sundown. <laughs> the good old days after third edition! This is <laughs> 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 All I'm saying is, give real combat a chance, Jack. 
<laughs> oh my god. Yeah, so so I think I'll pass on um on Metal so DM you enjoy Vengeance. Sundowners D and D. I'm campaign? afraid not. No. It sounds it sounds awful. I mean, the thing is, like, there there are like, you know, combat heavy games that can be fun. I I've I've played in a couple, but like this this just is framed in such a way that like it's just gonna turn people off because it's a role playing game. People are gonna assume that there's some level of role playing in that. Yeah, it, it's you know, it's it's push and pull between the like the the gm and the players surely like you don't want someone who is like dictatorial about not only this is what we're playing but like this is how you should play yeah like like in just a just a steel man like you know this this point as much as possible i would feel the same way about this if this was someone like this isn't some murder hobo game where we're gonna be killing everyone this is a like political intrigue game with all these different subplots and your characters need to be invested in every single conversation they need to talk to everyone they need to fuck everyone this (laughs) is like this is an hbo drama and if you can't handle the heat get out of the kitchen this is political intrigue meets pornography, and you're gonna yeah. love. God damn! All right, moving on to the next one. Speaking of pornography, um, I'm sure this would have been on the screen at the start of the video, but just blanket warning for uncomfortable sexual material. But let's be honest: if you know anything about this world and this community, like you already expected that. Yep it's it's almost it's almost like a community based on a game that has inbuilt power dynamics might have some people who abuse those power dynamics from time to time. Yeah, and that leads to this. So this is uh, tweets from someone whose name has been censored. I'm playing a female character. The DM had an NPC hit on me. I made it clear that my character was not interested on multiple occasions. I missed a session and was told my character slept with that NPC and will have to make a check to see if she is pregnant. I'm furious. Oh god, there's two terrible things about this. One is the taking the agency away when they're gone. The two is pregnancy tables. Just don't do them. Just don't do them, you guys. Yeah, Meg was telling me um, when I read this one to them about there being like a story of some person who was playing it and had like a weird kind of pregnancy fetish and their character was pregnant and would just like talk about it all the time in like excruciating detail. Oh my god. The thing is, pregnancy tables have, like, I remember back in college that, like, every other game would have, uh, you, it's like, roll to see what kind of child you might accidentally conceive when, when you, you know, with this, uh, tavern tryst that you had. Oof. And, uh, it ended up being not fun because, you know, maybe babysitting infants is not a good recipe for adventure. Yeah. And the alternative is, you know, the alternative is being chased around the world to pay your alimony and copper pieces. <laughs> Yodi child support bill. Incredible. Exactly. So th- there is a second tweet in this thread, by the way, that when I asked if he was serious and he said yes, I told him that it was wrong to do that to someone's character. He said something about alcohol being involved and left. I'm planning to quit the campaign. What would you do? I personally think this person um, has made the right choice. Fuck that weird DM, don't play. Yeah, no, fully agreed. Leave that game. He's clearly someone who doesn't respect you. I'd even say maybe try and give that character another shot if you can manage it. Like with somebody at at a more respectful table. Yeah, yeah. Take the character, keep, keep them as yours, and just go to people who are going to, like respect your autonomy as like a player and a friend exactly like don't let don't let some like weirdo who ran a bad table and did a bad experience like let you let them ruin one of your ocs for you exactly because those characters are yours and yours alone anyway next i believe this is a craigslist post (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) with the heading beautiful priestess needed for D D." are you ready oh god no Go on. Hi, my group of friends, and in parenthesis, around 30-year-old men, have a multi-year Dungeons & Dragons adventure going. This Sunday, there's a small scene where we encounter a beautiful naked priestess, and I thought it would be fun to have an, in, in like, scare quotes, actor play the part. It would require you to be topless on our virtual Zoom, so obviously you'd have to be comfortable with that. 
Our session starts at 4 p.m. this Sunday. The one trick is I don't know when exactly we will encounter this priestess. It will be at some point between 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern time. Ideally, you could be available in that time frame, and then I can text you at the precise time to join the Zoom link. The actual <laughs> scene won't be more than five minutes, so it won't be much time acting in scare quotes again, or provide some guidance on the part beforehand. Feel free to reply with any questions. Also, if you could include a picture of your reply, a picture with your reply, that would be helpful. Thanks. There are easier ways to show bare breasts to your entire D&D group, if that's your goal. Also, like, you, you know that, like, you don't have to go to Craigslist. There are people who, like, do this professionally. You could ask for a quote from, like, a cam girl. Exactly! Just pay a cam girl money to cosplay as a beautiful priestess, and she'll do it if you pay her, the like, a, a fair rate. But you know these dudes would be the kind of people who would be weird about, like, oh, but it's unwholesome if it's someone whose job is actually part of, like, sex work. I, I, I want to lure someone who is just a random Craigslist person in, like, it, it, it would be, like, someone who is, like, really fucking weird about having, like, an actual plumber come and do their pipes. It's like, I'd rather bother people on next door until I found someone in my neighborhood who was kind of handy to come and give, a like, a look at my sink. Yeah, it's so bizarre, too, because, like, the two things that they're looking for is, like, a bit of acting and, uh, I'm guessing, whatever pair of breasts they believe is attractive... They want those two things, right? So, like, sex worker, cam girl, that's the, that, that solves every issue. You know, if the, if the, uh, guy posting this was a real Chad, he'd buy some of those, like, foam boobs from, like, a prank store and he'd wear them during that scene. That's what I was gonna say, like... That's the G move, doing it yourself. You're the DM, don't fucking outsource your shit. Yeah, don't be a gay little baby. Put on, like, a falsetto voice and get some big baby. boobs. Be the, be the beautiful priestess. Make your, make your, like, all your guy friends really uncomfortable with how hot they now find you. Wouldn't that be, like, the most amazing, like, like, coming out story of, like, realizing your gender identity that I, like, oh my dressed God. up as the, the hot, topless priestess. Yeah, it would be so funny just, like, I was the, I was the DM of this campaign and I wanted to portray this, like, beautiful, hot priestess, so I did, like, three months of vocal training in order to feminize my voice and I realized I like my voice better that way, so now I'm on estrogen. <laughs> I, I want to put out a call to the uh, Dodge Gentleman fan base because I know that A, we have a bunch of like really awesome trans fans, and also that like a lot of like trans and genderqueer people um, are heavily involved in the RPG scene. So what I'd like to ask you is if there, if any of you have a story of something really like bizarre or funny, like some like media or experience making you first realize that you weren't cis, please tell us that story down in the comments. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. If you're comfortable doing so, of course. Yeah, if you want, if it's a cool, wholesome story, then share it in the comments below. We love cool, wholesome stories, not like these ones. Yeah, these are these are uncool, unwholesome stories. It would be amazing. The next video is. It's just like a part of the like the gentleman costume is now the like we we, we Skype in a sexy priestess. Ah uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my god. That'd be the ultimate move if we just decided one day we hated money. Yeah, exactly. I'm morally opposed to monetization. We we are Skyping in a topless priestess every episode. Yeah, fuck these drawn personas. I'm gonna come in with a coconut bra next time. Wouldn't it be like the most amazing thing if they like rip grab this dude like, yes, no, we we actually brought in an actual priestess and she is topless and it's some like fucking eighty year old nun. From some like <laughs> obscure island. <laughs> She's just chanting in Latin and like yeah. making a prayer for them. <laughs> she, she's like like one of those like kind of like all uh, like Oracle of Delphi looking things yeah. where they're all just like high off their tits and like, God, that's so funny. Wow, 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 guys! I, I, like you, you really pulled out all the stops. I can't believe like her eyes are glowing and like there there's appears to be some sort of demonic light appearing behind her. Is anyone else's skin burning? Yeah, are we are we being condemned to the pit right now? God. <laughs> all right. Next. So this is the context of a D and D group was like. Uh, I think maybe we want to make our uh, our. Uh, next game a little bit less violent and 
this one dude. I've noticed that, like, you know, I'm not big into this world. We might be in future. We're, we're considering an actual play. Ha ha. <laughs> but um, I've, I've learned a lot about the kind of nomenclature and that one of the pieces of nomenclature is that guy, capital T, capital O. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is what that guy posted as his thing for his character. Um, after they said, hey, maybe we'll make the next one next violent. Are you ready? Let's go. When he escaped, he used a shiv to violently kill a gith guard captain, and because of that became infatuated with killing, as it represented freedom and power to him. He will be chaotic, neutral, or evil, and his primary goal will be to destroy the Legion, and of course, what's a character that I make without a little bit of racism? He's going to loathe elves in general, but mainly gith, calling them fey fuckers. Wow, yep, that's that guy. I'm obsessed with the sentence, what's a character that I make without a little bit of racism? I feel like at this point, like, people who, like, you know, create characters with, like, heavy doses of fantastic racism, they're, like, they're just, I've never really played with one that it hasn't felt like a stand-in or, like, a euphemism for ways they really feel. Yeah, it is just one of those things that if you're someone who is bringing that into the space, um, it says things about you. It's one of those things where, like, I think that, like, some of these people might not have a race in particular they discriminate against, but they perceive that as a personal failing. There's, like, oh, I don't have enough hatred in my life. I need <laughs> to fill the void somehow. So in my escapist fantasy, I can be the racist that I want to be in real life. I've watched Birth of a Nation six times and nothing is happening. What am I doing wrong? It hasn't clicked. I, I don't want to mount the horses of, uh, of the of the, uh, the clan and then join up with the knights. I just wish I could. So next, we have a bad DM. Okay, let's hit it. And this is in the form of a Facebook chat. It's so fascinating because I feel like this video is going to feel like a fucking like, mixed media epistolary project. Because like each one of these has been like a different form. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, people game in all sorts of different ways these days. The DM says on Facebook, hey, what are you doing? The person says... Howdy, trying to find a wireless trigger for my camera's speed light. And the DM says, uh, what are you wearing? No, for real though. After much contemplating, I've decided that Fnord is going to succumb to his curse. So already it's pretty rough that they've started with the, like, uh, just joking, unless, what are you wearing? Very strange. Person responds, what exactly does that mean, Fnord is their character? And they say, well, I wasn't sure which direction I wanted to go with it when I had it enter you, but I like the outcome so far and the roles I had you make. I decided I would give you a fighting chance to resist. I can't give you a whole lot of details on what exactly the curse does, but essentially Fnord is mine now, so it means make a new character. The person says, oh, well that's super lame, and the person says, I have some ideas worth the character I'm going to pursue, which I think would make for good storytelling. The person says, I feel like my character effectively dying to a single failed save without myself or the party having a chance to fight it is a really lackluster way for me to lose him. So yeah, Gus, what is your opinion on the kind of loss of Nord here? I fully agree because one of the worst things that a DM can do is to rob a player of agency. And there's a sliding scale of that where like at some, uh, there are certain things that you must do in order to challenge them, right? Like, you know, people don't want to be, you know, don't want to fall in a hole, but sometimes maybe they fall in a hole. Uh, they might not want a certain person to, like, an NPC to think poorly of them, but, you know, it goes that way. But those are all things they can work on. Yeah, we make these little considerations. The ultimate stripping of agency is just flat out taking a character from somebody uh, and, and forcing them to make a new one. And I think that that is on display here. And again, the way the DM phrases it is like, oh, well, it'll be great for storytelling. This is a DM who's not invested in the collective storytelling experience. They have a plan and it's like, fuck you. The players don't actually matter. Yeah, there's something just so like fucked up and cruel about basically Fnord is mine now. Make a new character. The other thing, too, is that like it's one of these things where like something like that, like a curse taking a character from a person because there's rules for this in Pathfinder called the corruption system and people, you, you have to um, well ahead of time explain to people that you're playing with the corruption rules and that there's like a series of things that like will eventually make your character turn evil and go against the rest of the party. But just doing it flat out, not in game and having no sort of build up 
up towards it is the worst way to do it. Because even if there was a way to do Fnord falling into this curse and being taken by the DM in a good storytelling way, it's something that should happen in game so that everybody can collectively feel the loss and the other players can provide comfort to the player who's losing. And if you agree with us, comment with the hashtag, hashtag justice for Fnord. He deserved better than this. He was a Justice brave, a noble, whatever he was. I guess he's like a gnome or something from that name. Fnord. Yeah, he sounds like either a gnome or a viking. Justice for Fnord. Let's get that movement going. In this next one, this is an Instagram comment. God, these are varied. <laughs> if you are a DM who doesn't like metagaming, you should consider why. Most of the time, it's insecurity about not being smarter than your party members or clever enough to work through obstacles in life. Players should be able to use whatever they have available to gain an advantage over the DM. And if you can't handle that as a DM, you might not be cut out for the role of, uh, with that play group. How do you feel about that as a DM? Personally, I think that like metagaming is in like looking up, you know, stats out of the book when the DM throws a monster at you without doing like the, you know, the the roles you would usually do to like identify the monster in game. That's kind of skipping a gameplay element and it kind of robs you of a bit of challenge, of a bit of fun. So I think in a lot of cases, players who metagame are missing out on the experience, and they're, like, choosing not to be immersed in it. Yeah, it, it's super combative. Again, all of these th things feel like something that are, like, ground rules that you and your group, including your DM, should, like, decide on. It, it feels like the whole very counterintuitive, like, trying to win at role-playing, the whole language of, like... You need an advantage over your uh, your DM. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, like, you know, certain things like, like, certain elements of metagaming, like, when, like, people are like, oh, well, like, what does this person actually think? Can you tell me their alignment? Like, that stuff can actually get in the way of, like, you know, your first encounter with this person, because you're not, like, you know... It fucks with emotion. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, like... I think I think as a whole, like this idea of a competitive mindset of like, you know, it's a war of information. Y you should keep it to the in-game information because isn't it so much more exciting if you like win an encounter based on like context clues you discern from the fiction or you, you know, your character outsmarts uh, the chess master by figuring out their plan bit by bit with like the clues that you're provided. Like obviously... Obviously, there will be some players who are going to outsmart their DMs, but, like, it's not something that, like, this has never been a contest of intelligence. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, it's a collective fiction experience. You're sharing a story. It's meant to be, like, an adventure. Yeah, we're not playing chess here. Like, it's about more than just who knows the moves best. This does, however, lead us to another horrible DM. This one in the form of a 4chan green text post. Oh boy, wow, yeah, all of, we're running through all the mediums today. Yeah, again, this is, like, this video is an epistolary storytelling movie. So, DM gives players the ability to make money doing jobs during downtime. Amount of money is based on the background you chose, rather than proficiencies for some reason. Then in parenthesis, if you didn't pick Guild Artisan or Outlander, you're shit out of luck. Effectively stops giving us money during sessions, since we can make money from downtime jobs. Never gives us loot and won't let us buy equipment because he wants us to craft it ourselves. He's basically using the, craft is, uh, the crafting rules out of the PHB for some ungodly reason, so crafting anything worthwhile takes a ton of downtime. Except now that we don't get any money from adventuring, we can't do anything besides work during downtime, otherwise expenses pile up. DM constantly gives off vague implication that there's going to be consequences uh, for not doing other downtime activities like research or base building. Okay, so this strikes me as a DM who looked at a lot of these rules and wanted to implement them all in the campaign, but couldn't really figure out how to do them all in a way that actually works within the time frame of a real human social interaction. It feels like this would be the um, like RPG equivalent of like playing Shenmue 3. When it's just like, oops, all terrible repetitive minigames. Yeah, no, it, it really does almost feel like a, like, this is <laughs> a little bit of a dark joke, but it's just like, well, we're simulating the American healthcare system. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, you, you've, you've like introduced dark capitalism 
into your fucking D and D world. Yeah, exactly. Like it's like we want to do any other downtime thing, but the alienation of our labor is causing us to be unable to do so. We're stuck working at these jobs, paycheck to paycheck, because if we take even a little time off to go and adventure in this fantasy world, we'll be fucked monetarily. Which, by the way, feels like a great segue. Fans of this channel, fans of like role-playing games, and just fans of interesting fantasy in general, if you would like to hear a really cool fantasy story set in a fictitious kind of steampunk socialist state in early 20th century Europe, you should check out our new audio drama Kingmaker, show run by a uh, frequent channel contributor Meg Tootin, but Gus and I have also written episodes and voiced it. It's an amazing, fun fantasy adventure that lots of audiences and reviewers have compared to, like, experiencing a really fun, weird, like, D&D campaign. And it's right here on YouTube with all the requisite links right here. <laughs> exactly. And let me tell you, like, the the trio of characters in this, they, they have some money troubles of their own, and their misadventures to solve those money troubles are, are anything but dull. They are super fun and full of, like, magic casters of all different kinds. Weird creatures, an evil uh, milf witch with flesh powers played by friend of the show Addison Peacock. And it's set in an alternate history Europe where you can like trace a lot of like real trivia from it. It can even be an educational experience. It's very fun. Yeah, and it's got a hard magic system for those freaks who are real into that. So yeah, if you if you want to see be gay do crimes. <laughs> uh, the mag my I want my magic systems hard. The harder the better. <laughs> and if that if that sounds like you, go check out the Kingmaker Histories. It's fucking awesome. Uh, links in the description and right here. It's on Twitter, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcasts. You will enjoy it. After that little moment of fun, it's now getting really perverse. Ooh, this is a Reddit comment, which, because of downvotes, has zero points. I love shapeshifters. I want to make a shifter world homebrew centered around a war with shapeshifters. One idea that I had with perverted players disrupting the campaign was breast mimics. Let the player grope a busty tavern wench, have the mimics lick his fingers, and watch their faces turn to horror as you ask them to roll for agility. Maybe they keep their hand if they have a good roll, but I suspect they won't disrupt anymore. I'm not sure if the tavern wench is going to be a mind-controlled slave or a mad mimic tamer, or maybe start as one and become the other. I do think they should reside in women's bathhouses. Maybe they prey on young girls going into puberty. Maybe they're smart enough to make deals with less endowed women. Maybe they just attach to girls who fall asleep in the bath and make them forget any differences. They do need to have some basic influence over their hosts. It might start as mild mind control, then maybe through some addictive chemicals mixed with magic, they become dependent on them slowly going insane or maybe developing a particularly flirty yet manipulative personality. I think variety is key here. I want the mimics to have multiple options. If you're doing an NSFW campaign, you can make them have the ability to convert genders, but I think that's counterproductive to the goal of making my players scared of girls. You know, in addition to actual chess, doors, tables, books, rocks, and, well, everything. Okay. <laughs> that was a lot, I, I, I realize. What I love about this one is that it starts off as like, ah, uh, if you got perverted players, here's a little fix for them. You get them with one of these. And by the way, did you know all these deep, intricate things about this thing that I clearly have thought a lot about and am currently jacking my penis <laughs> over the idea of implementing into my RPG experience? And I love the little bit of like no homo transphobia at the end. Like, oh, you know, yeah, uh, you, you you could make them convert genders, I guess, but I wouldn't like that. Breast mimics are a female only power, homophile. Oh my god, this this is like so Kenku Cross Pill. It is so Kenku Cross Pill. Again, this is a classic like dude who watches too much really seedy anime. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cause or or he like thought that the um the uh the the, the power scene with the breast pads needed a little bit more biting. <laughs> from Chainsaw Man. It's one of those things where it's like, well, yeah, I already, like, associate with the kinds of people who, when playing D&D uh, &D without, let's be a realistic, all-male friend group, when we're not trying to, like, hire the women to be the sexy priestess, <laughs> we're getting our rocks off <laughs> by having our player characters grope fictitious tavern women voiced by our friend. 
Yeah, it's one of the strangest things where, like, and don't get me wrong, like, you know, I'll have characters that um, get into sexual relationships with the players. Like, the players will hit on these characters and have them as love interests. Uh, one particular player I have um, actually has, like, kind of a polycule thing going with, like, a number of different interdimensional beings. So, like, that's all well and good, but, like, when your players are not just, like, you know having sexually active characters, when your players are actually perverted, uh, here's a fix for that. Don't invent a type of monster that attacks perverts. Just don't play with fucking, like, perverts. Also, this person is obviously also a pervert. <laughs> they, they, they've mixed in, like, so many different fetishes here. It's like, oh, if you have players that are perverts, Clearly, the right option is to spank them with a leather paddle until they stop. Right, yeah, here's the, th here's the thing. I, like, I think, actually, I'm not going to kink shame here. If you are a pervert DM, DMing a perv table, like, d d fucking own it. Don't, don't, like... Don't, like, you know, punish them for doing the thing that you clearly want them to do. Yeah, this is a classic honey trap, which links us to the next one, because I want to get away from breast mimics as quickly as possible. Yeah, that guy certainly didn't. Yeah, no, he he's he's lingering on them. This next one, though, I, I, I will say is um, only slightly less weird. It's someone sharing their character on Discord. Again, we have Discord now, so it's just really no end. And they're all the howling different... at the moon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, backstory. Karsai was always a prodigy of the necromatic schools of magic due to his life growing up around the constant dark magic and undead in the kingdom of Darkseid. But due to this condition, he never got to experience neither loss nor love. Neither did he experience much of any feelings in general, other than greed, anger, and surprise. One day, he saw tourists coming into the city, displaying signs of constant affection to each other. He asked them what they were doing, and they answered showing love and affection. Being as curious as he is, decided to leave the town full of curiosity and wonders about the world. He managed to kill a bandit right outside of the town and reanimated the dead bandit as an undead, and he decided to name his first animated kill Ignis, which he keeps as one of his prized possessions to this day, not before robbing the camp clean of bodies of loot, of course. Not now with the powers of his undead army, pocket storage, being a greedy kleptomaniac hoarder, and possibly necrophilia with his first undead Ignis, he may be able to learn more about this odd thing called feelings. Major weaknesses. Lustful motherfucker without Ignis to keep him satisfied for a long time. Greedy to a dot. Being kleptomaniac does not help. Believes everything that he wants is his possession. Has shit social skills to a real damned point. Believes most issues can be solved by turning the problem into an undead. Minor weakness. Hates being told no. Doesn't know the importance of bonds. Easily deceived when emotions are involved in the lie. Has a hoard of stuff in his pocket storage, including 200 cabbages. Has a tendency to forget things left in storage, including people shoved in it just a second ago. So, Gus, if you were putting a new thing together, how would you feel if someone said, yeah, this is Karsai, this is who I'm bringing to the table? I really, I really don't like it because... <laughs> Uh, apart from apart from the idea that like this clearly like unable to consent unintelligent zombie is his constant it's sex like sex slave. Yeah, I I also just really hate the fact that this guy mismanages his inventory this much. Yeah, like, like for God's sake, man, get your shit together. I can excuse necrophilia. I can't excuse having two hundred cabbages in your inventory. This is so repulsive. This is this just so would repulsive. Not be a fun person to play with because you know no. they'd be super weird. Or all the time. This is the worst version of the horny bard who likes to fuck, the edgy warlock who likes to fuck. Yeah, this is like, and, and it's one of those things too where it's like, you know that like a shitstorm would brew if the DM killed this sex zombie. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> you kill Ignis and I walk. Uh, this wouldn't be as bad if they just confirmed that Ignis was intelligent and was consenting. Yeah, like, it's 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 rough. It's really rough. The thing is, like, you know, people get into all sorts of, uh, like, interspecies romance and stuff, and it's if, if it's a, sen a sentient consenting undead, like a lich or a vampire or something, or even a zombie lord or a skeleton lord, I don't know the mechanics of how you... Yeah. With a Leave skeleton, but... 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, get really boning down with those anyway. The, the 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 thing is, um, you know, just any kind of non consensual uh, zombie fucking is really just something that nobody should have at their table. Yeah, it's like you know, I, I really wish um, my RPG campaigns were more like the movie Dead Girl. <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> God damn it! God damn it! Someone had to make a Dead Girl reference. Fuck me. It was doomed to be one of us. All right, you ready for the next one? Yep. Yeah, let's go. So your uh, tabletop team is going to hate me for introducing this one into your head. Oh, boy. So this is a Facebook post, so we're really running the gamut here. Yeah. Earlier tonight, I posted a comment about having microtransactions in a campaign, and everyone jumped on it, talking about pay-to-play or how it was evil to even think of it. Now let me give you the same scenario, but change the wording. A DM puts lots of time and energy to provide for their players. I myself provide food, drinks, props, mini binders for the players to keep track of their characters, and that's all out of my pocket. Now, am I evil for giving a player an extra healing potion, or giving them a temp bonus to, say, their investigation for the night, for providing some cash to pay for the food or drinks or anything else? You fucking, like, landlord dick. You Again, fantasy landlord dick. microtransactions into fucking... D&D. You know what? That's so bullshit because, again, <laughs> this stuff is handled by the social contract. I remember in college, I had a campaign where, like, yeah, I would I would do the campaign and we, like, started to want the same snacks every now and then. So, like, people would just get the snacks and they would show up and, like, there would just be enough snacks for everybody. Yeah, you do the thing, like, so-and-so will host, so-and-so brings the beers, so-and-so brings the crisps. Like, it was never something that I was, like, um, based on, like, you know, your or, uh, participation in this game, you have to do, you have to give me this much money. <laughs> like, <laughs> just thinking, let's, let's play the game and then, like, asterisk beneath it, may contain in game purchases. <laughs> it's also really funny because I think one of my favorite, uh, college DD experiences, which was one of the last times, uh, I gamed in college because it was my final semester there, I had a bunch of meal plan money left over at the end of the month, uh, or at the end of the semester. Uh, so what I ended up doing is that like for our final session of our campaign, I got like a bunch of chicken wings from the cafeteria <laughs> and we just like, we just ate chicken, like tons and tons of chicken wings while we were doing the final, uh, final session. I love that. That's amazing. This next one is just one sentence. Oh. <laughs> and it was a post directly onto the subreddit that just says, my final boss for the year-long campaign that I've been running was beaten to death by dildos yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You feel I, that. I feel that so hard. Because if you've been a DM for any amount of time and you're any kind of good sport, something like this has happened to you. That's the thing. You can't force people to take things seriously. <laughs> Not only that, but like people are going to find it a challenge to like deal with with a, with a boss in the most ridiculous way, like and I'm I'm guilty of this too. I was just telling you the other day about how um I defeated a dungeon boss with my um Koa Toa character in three point five by throwing a fishing net over the boss and pulling the net so he fell back into the portal to hell. I love that. And funnily enough, Les's Morg fans will also notice that that's how um Riley killed the dragon in the uh, Less is Morgue D&D episode. Here's the thing. Dildos actually have, like, a history of being weaponized uh, across, like, many editions of D&D. Um, in particular, th there was a book in D&D 3.5, which, bringing it up now, certain people will know. Uh, other people will be finding out for the first time. But uh, the Book of Erotic Fantasy, which was uh, famously sex themed splat book for D and D splat book. You say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it had stats for a number of different dildos, including like what their weight is, how they could be used as weapons, you know, their heft, their girth, all that. Once you introduce rules like that, you can't really unring that bell. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny because I had a character, uh, from those days that used a class from that because for some reason there was like a erotic dancer who was also like the class was an erotic dancer that could also use improvised weaponry, uh, I guess to reference like, you know, the pole or like props uh, that, 
So that's so aggressively. So I gave my my halfling fighter like a level in it so that he could wield a giant anchor. Incredible. Yep. This next one is horrible, but it makes me laugh. Are you ready? G yeah, go for it. So it's another four chain green text. Player character's goal is the resurrection of his wife. DM explained early on that it's a relatively simple goal since it's basically just collect 2,490 gold, the calculated cost of a resurrection spell. Gold comes slowly, takes several games before we get a small pile thanks to several setbacks, including several run-ins with the cult that killed the player character's wife. Finally, meet a cleric powerful enough to cast the spell, and he even offers a thousand gold discount if we reclaim his captured temple. After killing literally hundreds of people, we finally succeed, and it's time for a happy reunion. The cleric asks which plane he should start searching for the wife's soul. The player character replies, Celestia, since that matches her alignment. The resurrection spell fails. Quote, I'm sorry, your wife's soul was unwilling to be resurrected, and she's in hell. What the fu- Okay. Forget getting into the weeds of the rules mechanics of this, because they can vary from table to table. This was all great up until the ending. Yeah, it seemed like actually a pretty legitimately cool story. A classic, like, um, Orpheus and uh, Eurydice type thing. Yeah, the, like, the reclaiming the temple. Like, it was, it was, like, something where it's, like, you know, they worked up to the conclusion. And it would have been great if, like, maybe the white, maybe the cult condemned the wife to hell based on, like, you know, some ritual they did. And they have to, like, reclaim her or something. They have to, like, go to hell to physically get her back. And that's the final thing. Or, or even, like, you know, they have to find some way to, like, undo the cult's grip on her soul. And so that she can be resurrected the normal way. It would all be good without the, like, sorry, all the resources you've done up until now uh, fail and you have to now completely do another quest if even the chance is given it was all it was all smooth sailing until that ending like really yeah it's just kind of a very like mean spirited ending it reminds me of that like limmy sketch with the like every time you think of them the demons actually hurt them more <laughs> yeah. no it's so true <laughs> but like yeah you, you just have to not be happy no it's literally uh sorry She's doing stairs. Yeah, she's doing stairs. And, and you know how, and you, know how uh, you said that uh, she hated going out? They're making her go out. Like, <laughs> yeah. That, that, like, veil you saw her wearing was actually a gauze of spiders constantly crawling over. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. It's, it's so, it's so, like, needlessly cruel. Yeah, like, it's I... It's fucking evil. I think that's the main thing, is that, like, if someone's main goal is something, never, like, just stop it dead in its tracks and have them need to, like, start over and start a completely different quest. Always have the next step in reaching that goal uh, stem from the previously built up elements. Otherwise, they're just going to feel cheated. Yeah, you're meant to yes and, not just no. Especially if you've already yes anded a bunch and then you go no. It's like, well, why were you yes anding? Now we go from a terrible DM to a terrible player. I think this will make you angry. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Delay it on me. I rarely play rogues, but when I do, I choose between elves and tabaxes. However, once I did a goblin rogue, sort of was the party's pet. And it turns out that a year later, in-game, I ended up murdering the party. Quick explanation. You do not touch Squirt's bread. Parenthesis. Squirt was my goblin's name. When we got uh, a mana for our deeds, I got paid in bread. And the party ate it in a food shortage. Hesitantly, I acted upon my floor. Do not touch my bread. So I assassinated them one by one. Their faces of confusion was priceless, and they got mad at me when the DM revealed that it was me. The campaign was going to end anyway, so I don't feel bad. Wow, uh, this feels like an entire, this feels like a complete misfire on all parts, because they ate the bread, and the DM you let the person do the assassination and also revealed it. Let Squirt kill every single one of them. And, and there was, you know, the campaign was gonna end anyway, so it's just like, yeah, I don't know how this could have ended better, really. Bro, fuck Squirt. But at the same time, like, I'm also just like, okay, well, if this is a PvP table, maybe Squirt was just doing what they were enabled to do, you know what I mean? Squirt was just as much a victim of the system as anyone else. Yeah, yeah. So, next one, this is about um, someone who did some, like, shitty things tangential to D&D. &D. Oh, okay. All right, a little out-of-table drama. Worst that guy I ever had to deal with was a few years ago. We had a cool but disabled bro in our group. 
with a neural condition that meant he lacked most of his sense of touch, which created other medical complications in turn. He didn't like to be touched at all, and the rest of us respected this. That guy kept jostling him and talking about how cool it would be to have a quote-unquote superpower like that, and all the jackass-tier shit he would do if he couldn't feel pain. Anyway, he got kicked out of the group and then showed up for the next week's session as if nothing had happened. GM eventually had to call the cops to get rid of him. Yeah, that guy just sucks. Like, this is not even about the game. That guy just sucks. It reminds me of, uh, so we reviewed Nobody on the Patreon a while back. Which, by the way, Patreon, um, great if you'd like to hear us talk about, like, movies and weird shit in a more kind of casual, off-the-cuff way, um, similar to this. So, yeah, go check that out. Only a dollar a month. And we can cover movies that, like, there's no way we'd be able to talk about on YouTube. Like, just kind of, like, out-of-the-way stuff. Exactly, and it's great. But at the start of Nobody, when he gets, like, home invaded... Everyone who talks to him after that is like, ah, oh, I wish it was my house. You know, I could use the exercise, like, beating the fuck out of those guys. And that's a similar thing of like, hey, this shitty thing that happened to you, I wish it happened to me. I would have been rad in your shoes. That, it's just so weird to just harass people for their, like, personal struggles. Okay, so moving away from that dickhead, here's, a, here's an interesting thing of uh, DM versus PC war. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate breakdown in diplomacy. It's another 4chan one. Yeah, first DM was absolute trash. Join into an existing group, don't really know the other players. Have mentally unstable Sork, I assume that sorcerer character. Yep. Goddamn baked goods aficionado. Stores spells in cookies like scrolls, etc. That's pretty cool. I like that as an idea, like a baking sorcerer. Yeah, no, like, um, there's a witch archetype in Pathfinder 2 that, like, cooks people into into gingerbread cookies that then heal you. That's a fetish. But, um, <laughs> as we discussed in the latest Spongebob Boys. <laughs> you know what? The, the less I say about certain Pathfinder witch hexes, the better. Let's just move on. Pass for the best. But, um, anyway. A good month or two in, DM hates me and my character for enjoying the game instead of following his perfect plot points and quantum ogres. Other players also getting a little butthurt over the railroading. Go into the Underdark, meet Durigur Merchant. Very nice man, has cool pastries, clearly the DM put something cool in for my character. Then quote, roll a con save. Character is immobilized and starts taking huge amounts of damage. Albahal Cleric paints the walls with the merchant. After fight with my character is about to force feed this asshole one of the pastries. DM is just appalled. Pleasant surprise when the cleric teammate steps up and starts helping me, healing and restraining the guy. We shit on a pastry and force feed him. All the players have a good giggle while the DM is being a pissy bitch. The player has become a lifelong friend and now I'm forever DM for that group after he ran them off. So no loss in the end. Plenty more fun stories from that guy. So what do you think? I think that's really fun, like, honestly. Because, like, a very punishing railroady DM ultimately, like, getting theirs when the players manage to triumph over it through teamwork, that's that's cool. It's ultimately not how most games should go. It's not ideal. But, like, I like where this went as a story. And I like that a good table came out of this bad table. Yeah, and I just like the concept of, like, a kind of, like, just someone who does uh, magic baking, kind of like the uh, the mum in Encanto. Yeah, exactly. Magic baking can be a lot of fun. Yeah, there are just lots of cool original ways to use magic. We were actually talking about this earlier today, how one of the kind of least interesting and compelling uses of, like, magic in characters is just firing generic energy blasts out of your palms. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and it's one of those things, too, where, like, I think about in fiction, like, JoJo stands, for example. The least interesting ones of those are just the ones that, like, hit you with some kind of big energy blast, or they just, like, punch you really hard, and they don't have much limitations. And they were, like, weaned away as the series continued, and everything started to become just, like, these very obscure, very weird powers that, like had to be implemented in interesting ways by their users. I like that. So anyway, next one, you'll love this, because this is a Pathfinder one. My neighborhood. Pathfinder Adventure, we're a party of four. There's a supporting character played by the DM who's a catfolk ninja who talks in a babyish cat voice. I don't know how to explain. His name is Nyanamin also. For context, I play an undying war priest, Nyanamin. So, you have to go to the temple, but look out for... Dangers! And then... Me, OOC, dangers, Nianamin, 
Are you making fun of me? You stupid fish, how dare you? Go back to your stupid sea. I'll make sushi out of you. Also, he starts calling me fish instead of my character's name, Mary. Me. Wait, I was out of character. My DM. I know. Now Nyanamin says you're racist. Me. How am I the racist one here? No, y Nyanamin got very racist in retaliation to that. This sounds like a side character you'd see in something, and you'd just immediately be like, oh, I hope you die so soon. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hope that this is just like, wow, Nyanamin, you're really racist. We're not going to hang around you anymore. This is one of those things that immediately just, like, roll to stab Nyanamin. Yeah, exactly. Kill Nyanamin. Use your, use your undying hydraulic push ability to push Nyanamin off into the water. Cats hate water. <laughs> just drown Nyanamin. <laughs> yeah, just drown Nyanamin. We regret to inform you that Nyanamin was killed and stuffed into a box by the Smile Demon. Also, I gotta say is that, like, you know, Undyne's don't deserve in-game shit. They've got enough problems with their mechanics. They're a really, really underpowered race. Fair. Next, I have, uh, it's so funny how many of the- that last one was from Tumblr, so that's another one. Back to 4chan. A lot of these are green texts. Alright, you ready? Yeah, let's go. Public game at store, then in parenthesis, first mistake. Playing D&D &D 5e, second mistake. Some high school kid of 14 or 15 joins in the game. Forget what he played, human or elf or something, barbarian or fighter. Not a lizard folk, that's for sure. Says this is his first time playing any tabletop game. Oh no. He mentions his character as a cannibal. Oh please god no. Friendly NPC gets killed by a stray arrow during battle. Says he will immediately go over and start eating the corpse, in front of everyone. The guardsmen attack him. Our PC paladin attacks him. He doesn't understand why he was attacked and killed, so we have to explain it to him for over a minute. I overhear him talking to the guy beside him that he based his character off of his MLP OC. This kid not only mentions that he made his cannibal pony OC and that he was playing as him, but next week he's going to make another cannibal character. He showed up for one more game and stopped showing up, presumably because nobody liked his character. It is just really funny that it's like, why did everybody attack me for abandoning the combat and trying to eat, like, a friend of ours? Yeah, eat one of our dead friends. He was trying to give him a warrior's death. Oh my god, a warrior's death. Oh god, no! Please watch Psycho Goreman if you haven't. <laughs> Hell yeah, Psycho Gorman. Oh, I also just so love funny. that this guy, like, rolled up to the table with, like, fucking Alicorn <laughs> Steve from Fresh and thought he wasn't gonna, like, cause problems. <laughs> That's so funny. It was like, like, an Applejack locks you in the basement. I'm gonna sell you meat. Oh, I don't eat apples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Please go. Uh, another reason to join Patreon. Addison and Gus reviewed Fresh. It's great. And, and, uh, Yellow Jackets. Addison is our resident cannibal expert. Yes. Are you ready for the next one? This is, this is a story of marital strife. Oh, oh god. D&D 3.5, playing at DM's house, two kids, very young, like toddler age and a little above, grabbing our dice, grabbing minis, just absolute little devils, telling them no or please stop makes them more excited, and grabbing your stuff before you stop uh, them becomes a game. DM's wife always forgets what your class does. It's a psionic class to boot. DM throws us in a dungeon when we get captured by a collection of mind flayers. Rogue is late to the game since he overslept due to coming off of night shift work. Kills his character on the spot. Sneaks, way, uh, sneaks our way through the dungeon. Decide to rescue an NPC. Bust into a room. There's a mind flayer. It casts mass stun on the party. Wife walks away to change one of the monster's diapers since he shit himself. Wife gone. DM power word kills his wife after she walked away. My face when that's a ninth level or some shit and we're level five. Wife comes back. Finds out she's fucking dead. Starts watching Netflix real loud. What a truly awful time that was. <laughs> That is a terrible gaming experience. <laughs> Imagine killing your own wife's player character while she's away, changing your baby's nappy while you play D and D. You fucking deadbeat. This is so funny because, like, I know a married couple that I've like gamed with, and like they are so good at balancing, like, taking care of their daughter while they're doing it to the point that, like, the daughter will be there, like, during the during the game, like, picking up some of the little LED lights they put on the table, like, you know, throwing the dice around, but they'll just be like, okay, time to clean up, and she'll just put them back in the box. It's because they knew they'd be a DD and d house, so they're like, all right, well, these objects are going to be around our kid. Let's treat our kid how to treat these objects with respect. That's actually a, a clever and good way to do it. I'll tell you what is not clever and good, though. 
the next one. So this one came with the context that a few of my friends were going to start a comedy actual play series. Oh, 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 comedy actual play series are always funny and always play the game well. <laughs> they're, they're not always like sitting through the cringiest like college improv group you've ever seen and occasionally people roll dice and yeah. occasionally they play the game this is the the first one bobo was a first class food eating competitor winning tournament after tournament for over five years one day he met his match when a thin young asian man by the name of jackie chang with a g took his crown away and started to win every tournament this led to Bobo spiraling into a deep depression that culminated in a bout of rage that sent him to prison for six months. During his time serving, his fat has been sculpted into muscle, which makes him quite the intimidator. He has completed serving his time now, but is too nervous to get back into the food eating circuit. Instead of beating Jackie Chang in competitive food eating, his goal is now to fuck Jackie's wife instead because he is so swole and handsome. This is his one and only mission in life. And someone else responded, that's fucking hilarious. And I just noticed, this is a Discord conversation. The post had dated, this was on 9-11, 2018. <laughs> what? Never forget Bobo. That was my 9-11. It sounds like the dude from Taxidermia. That's what I was going to say. This is like the taxidermia guy if he became a barbarian. Go check out <laughs> instead of a Hungarian. Yeah, well, he was always a Hungarian, but now he's a Hungarian <laughs> joking barbarian. About the other day, just the idea of the barbarian poster, but it's Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm a barbarian, but I had been at a meal for a while, so now I'm a Hungarian. <laughs> God. See, this is so stupid and would be so unfunny. Because this character's backstory is so, like, stupid and specific, and the fact that he's called Bobo means yeah. that inevitably he's just going to spend all of his time talking about this one joke, which is either, I need to fuck this guy's wife, or like, oh, I used to be a competitive eater. I don't know. The thing is, I think there is some potential in this character. I'll be honest, because, like, the idea of bringing a taxidermia character to the D&D &D table is very funny to me. Like, any of those three dudes from taxidermia as a D&D &D character uh, could lead to some really interesting things. And I think what all of them really need was was a friend or a, group, or a found family. There'd be a great party together. <laughs> in a kind of uh, Stardust Crusaders fashion. The crossover episode where they go across time and they all team up to defeat their family's worst enemy, who I guess is... The state. Or Jackie Chang. <laughs> yeah, God. It's another green text. Pathfinder campaign. Evil army of orcs about to attack city. Set up this whole battle with a defend the wall scenario. Even a special handmade miniature for the war golem the orcs have. Have been building up to this battle for months. Set up the battle. Start playing. One player rolls a twos for his character's attacks on the first round of combat. Another player who has been pissing off this player all day makes some sort of comment. A player who rolled the ones complains that the player should have done something about it. Other player mocks him in some other way. First player fucking explodes from a combination of being goaded and his fucked up rolls. Throws dice across the miniatures map. Rips up character sheet. Walks out, slams door two or three times, then starts kicking the shit out of it, breaking a hole in it before slamming it so hard, something falls off a nearby shelf and shatters, punches a hole in the wall, comes back half hour later and we continue. Rest of the party keeps getting salty whenever they get damaged. Later they make fun of the miniature I made. Oh my god. Wow. That guy, that guy had to be playing a barbarian. Not in the yeah. game, but in real life. <laughs> he went into his rage. Yeah, in that his character, like like him as a player, may have been the mother from the film Barbarian. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Just grabs the other guy and just smushes his head and roars and runs off. Yeah, just the idea of him destroying this door and punching the drywall is so you, really funny. He destroyed this man's house. And he ripped up his character sheet. Some people genuinely just have like proper anger issues and they make it everyone else's problem. I just love the idea, like the end of this, like, you know, terrifying outburst where he's like, you know, destroying the support beams of this entire house, <laughs> fucking humping holes in the wall, tearing down, like, you know, the, the tearing the like, like, like safety glass. I will tear out apart of this ceiling. impressive establishment. 
bored, boy, bored. And then he just sits down and he's like, all right, let's fucking kill these orcs. <laughs> it's like, dude, you fucking wrecked my house. <laughs> By the way, your miniature shit. Yeah, yeah, you suck. <laughs> God, it's awful. Penultimate one. This was posted to a, like, RPG group advice page, and this will second uh, immediately put a chill down your spine. So one of my player's family member passed away, and her character also has a master outside of Barovia. I want to make similar impact to her character, but show her my respect. Like, Strahd visit her and tell her that her master passed away as well. There will be a magic item and others, but I want to know, is it okay for Strahd to spread the news from outside like a middleman? Any ideas? Thank you. Don't do this! Instead, if their real-life family member died, out of respect, I'm gonna do the same to one of their player characters' family members. Yeah, like, I wanted, I wanted, as a touching gesture to my friend who I'm playing this game with, I want to remind them of their real-life trauma in this game by taking something from their character forever. They're, they're trying to do, like, the end of that one IT crowd episode, but without any of the, like, pathos and charm, where, a uh, Moss... Helps Roy like process his breakup through D and D. Yeah, this is this is like someone steps on a thumbtack and is in deep pain, so you slam their fingers with a hammer because hey, they're not thinking about the thumbtack anymore. That classic like dad move. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Last one, and this is one that Gus has seen before. It's the one I actually showed to Gus to get this video greenlit, but I couldn't not. Oh boy. Oh no. Oh, here we go. My play characters want to destroy a city. How should I handle this? Help, please. My players have managed to convince the army of kobolds to help them sink a city by planting explosives all around the underground sewer system. This is all for the sake of stealing a small box that a certain NPC has, and they don't want to bother coming up with other ways of getting it. Now the city is the focal point of the campaign is going to be destroyed, and I've tried to stop it at every possible turn, but the, guys, the dice gods are with my players and I have no idea what to do. Any idea on how to stop this or how I should handle the situation? This is really funny. How would you handle this happening to you? I'm trying to think, because like, I did run a sandbox city game once, uh, but I think what I did was... I never made the city so easy to destroy. I think what I'd uh, try to do is have someone catch wind of their plan, you know, go after the kobolds or move the bombs or something. Yeah, like the captain of the guard and his men. Yeah, like I'd try to involve some other faction and like, you know, make them make them like sort of like enemies in that way. Because that was the thing that um, made the, uh, the, the city game that I ran compelling that like, no matter which way the players went, there was going to be some faction that they'd interact with. They'd make friends, enemies. If the story is now about, like, the players are mad bombers, make people yeah. who want to catch mad bombers. Yeah, no, exactly. You have to roll the punches. If your players have just decided collectively they're going to be, like, a terrorist cell, then you have to be flexible to that. The thing is, I want to tell you now about uh, me being on the other side of this. Yes, yeah, you, you alluded before we started recording that you had a similar funny D&D story, so we'll end with that. Yeah, so this is all the way back in high school, where basically it was a, it was a campaign set in a, like, city ruled by this, like, dragon who the players uh, over like over time become like sort of the mercenaries in charge of protecting the capital. They're given sort of like the royal treatment. They're the royal heroes. There's a mini arc. There was a mini arc in this where they had to go and like address something that was happening in the slums of the city. Like there was this like ghost monster that was like running around in the slums and like killing people and and like using them in some kind of like weird ritual. And basically the players go to the slums. They look for this ghost. They realize this ghost could be like anywhere in any of these buildings and seems to be able to like fuse with the architecture and stuff. So they do the one natural thing you might do in that situation is that they force everyone to evacuate the slums and they burn it to the fucking ground. Oh my God. Yeah, well, the, the ghost was really easy to find after that. There were no buildings. He was just out it's, in the open. How did you find the ghost in the end? We burned the forest down whilst away. <laughs> we never really addressed where all the slum dwellers would be living post that point? That sounds like a them problem. <laughs> yeah, we fucking got rid of their ghost. You're welcome. <laughs> and 
that concludes our fucking D and D nightmares video. Please let us know if you'd like more in this vein because it's a pretty you know established subreddit. Please go check out the Kingmaker histories. We provided all the links, description, top comment, video. You'll love it if you enjoyed this. And any final thoughts for us, Gus? Yeah, well, the thing is, like, I love talking about this hobby. It's it's a big passion of mine. And I've been gaming with, like, one group in particular for a really long time that uh, I'm really attached to. But I've gamed with so many other different groups in my day. And... It's just something that I don't get to talk about a lot on the channel, but it means a lot to me. The people I play with mean a lot to me. The game itself means a lot in the way that it brings people together. And by seeing these kind of rank, nasty, doo-doo versions of what could be a good table and good experience, you know, I appreciate it all the more. Yeah, no, I, I think it is one of those things. And that actually gives me a great idea. Final fucking comment call, but this is something that I'm genuinely curious about. If you have a D&D horror story, post it in the comments, and if we make another one of these, we'll draw from the comments and credit you. Absolutely. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. I, oh, I this would is gonna love be fun. to hear people's, like, RPG horror stories. Oh, I know our audience has some. Like, like a lot of people have these D&D stories. I'm, I'm excited. That'll be awesome. Me too. And yeah, I'd say that's about it. Final words, Gus. Well, uh, you know, um, uh... The catchphrase. <laughs>